Good morning, dear UniWell colleagues and friends, and welcome to the UniWell Open Lecture Series. Today's lecture topic is international law, equality, and socioeconomic justice, a view from women's and girls' human rights by Professor Dorothy Stradatant from the University of Murcia. I'm really honored to introduce you to Professor Do uh, Dorothy Estrada-Tant, with an extensive background in public international law and a wealth of experience in promoting human rights. She's a public international law professor and the legal uh, clinic co-director at the Faculty of Law of the University of Murcia. Currently serving as the chair of the UN Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls, Professor Estrada Tank has advocated for gender equality and empowering women, women globally. Her dedication and expertise have allowed her to contribute significantly to shaping international policies and initiatives to eliminate discrimination. Professor Estrada Tang's academic achievements are equally impressive. She holds a PhD in law from the prestigious, prestigious universe, uh, European University Institute in Italy and an MSc in political theory from the renowned London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Furthermore, she obtained her law degree from the esteemed Escuela Libre de Derecho in Mexico. Throughout her career, Professor Strada Tant has garnered various experiences across different sectors, from working with the United Nations and state bodies to collaborating with NGOs and universities in Mexico, Italy, Spain, the US and Canada, she has dedicated her efforts to championing human rights, gender equality, human security, migration and social economic justice. A testament of her experience, Professor Estrada Tant has authored the acclaimed book titled Human Security and Human Rights and International Law the protections offered by persons confronting structural vulnerab vulnerabilities. This influential work published by Hart Publishing in Oxford earned her the Distinguished Best Book Award in 2017 from the Inter-American Bar Association in Washington, DC. In her commitment to advancing human rights globally, Professor Estrada Tant recently concluded a joint mission to Afghanistan as part of her work with the UN Working Group. This mission aimed to assess and report about women and girls in, in the country, highlighting the importance of ensuring her protection and empowerment. Please join me in welcoming Professor Estrada Tan, whose dedication and expertise continue to shape the human rights landscape and inspiring change for a more inclusive and equitable world. Thank you very much. And Dorothy, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Vice Rector Pascual Cantos and to the UniWell organizers, to Jorge Piernas, coordinator here at our University of Murcia, and Edu Perez Asensio, who has tirelessly worked to make this possible, and to all our UniWell uh, colleagues who have uh, contributed to this uh, day. Thank you so much also to colleagues from uh, the universities of uh, the UniWell Alliance, as well as colleagues from other academic institutions and uh, civil society organizations. And to everyone here, thank you uh, very much again for your presence. I will uh, now share the screen in order to start the presentation. And I would ask uh, that if uh, during the presentation you have uh, questions or comments that you could kindly include them in the chat. Uh, they will be uh, read out at the end of the talk um, by our moderator, Professor Irene Vasquez, who I'm, I also thank deeply for being here uh, today. Uh, so it will be done in this written form so that I can then address them and we can have uh, a, an exchange on points that you would want to comment on. So I will now share uh, the screen. And hopefully this is uh, visible and we can start in this way uh, with the uh, reflections on international law, equality, 
and socioeconomic justice, a view from women's and girls' human rights. So as uh, you may have seen in the presentation of this talk of today, I will concentrate mainly on two central questions. How has the legal international economic order specifically uh, impacted women and girls? And uh, in which ways can we use and apply international human rights law creatively to reaffirm women's and girls' human rights, and also to further to construct economic and gender equality and socioeconomic justice? So I would like to start out in relation to the first question by reflecting on the global context. What are the hard data that we can look at when addressing these questions. So the first idea that I would want to pose to you is that poverty, as you see on the screen, is more than the outcome of a lack of income or wealth, which is how it may uh, traditionally be understood in strictly economic terms. Poverty is actually the result of a blatant systemic failure leading to a vicious, a vicious cycle of exclusion and discrimination that violates the whole range of human rights recognized by international human rights law, civil and political, economic, social, and cultural, as well as the right to development, not only of the present uh, generations, but also of future generations, as has been uh, duly noted by climate justice activists. Now, what is the situation of women and girls today in terms of poverty and socioeconomic inequality? Women and girls, which are roughly half of the global population, are disproportionately represented among the world's poor people. We know that global projections show that an estimated 388 million women and girls were living in extreme poverty in 2022, compared with three, 372 million men and boys, which is of course not a, promise, a promising uh, figure uh, in any case. This is obviously a global uh, problem, but let's look at it uh, with a gendered lens in terms of assessing these disproportionate impacts. We know also that 83.7% uh, of these women and girls living in extreme poverty uh, were located in, to, in 2022 in two main regions, in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Central and South Asia. Now, this is Dorothy, the issue of poverty. Dorothy, uh, forgive yes. me, forgive me, but we can't follow your presentation on screen. Could you put uh, it in presentation mode? I'm so sorry to interrupt you. No, that's fine, that's fine. And thank you, and thank you, Pascual, for noting that. Um, I'm not sure... Could anyone guide me as to how to do? Because it it does say that I am that I am uh, sharing the screen. So maybe let's see if I do this. Is this visible now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, okay, yeah, no. perfect. Thank you so much for noting that. And in any case, uh, since we are starting out with these um, data, these figures, and statistics of the global context, uh, as I was saying, and you see them there on the screen we see how women and girls are disproportionately represented among the world's uh, poor people. Now, if we look not only at poverty, but also at inequality, that is at the gaps between the poor and the rich, uh, we see how at a global level, extreme inequality has also deepened, not only poverty, but also inequality. And that since 2020, the richest 1% of the world has seized two thirds of all new wealth, the wealth created from 2020 up to now. And this is almost twice as much money as the bottom 99% of the global population. And this is obviously fueled and triggered by uh, uh, the economic landscape created by the COVID-19 pandemic. We know that the pandemic and the resulting economic uh, consequences and crisis have deepened poverty, but also inequality in the sense that uh, people that are at the top of the uh, uh, socioeconomic uh, scale have become uh, richer in, in, in different sectors of the economy. And uh, this phenomena is also linked to the global food crisis, to energy and care crisis, which in turn connect to other crises such as uh, the armed conflict, 
and the invasion, the, the invasion by Russia of Ukraine, also other situations of armed conflict, if, if one thinks of Yemen, if one thinks of Sudan very uh, recently, if one thinks of several places in the Middle East, if one thinks of Ethiopia. And these uh, uh, factors are, of course, interconnected. There is not a one, a, only one uh, facet of these uh, phenomena, but we see how the interconnectedness of these uh, different phenomena has resulted in a rise, uh, not only of inter-country uh, income inequality, but also uh, at the differences between countries. So we see a rise in inter-country, meaning inequality within uh, a country, if we are to place the example here in Spain, and we have seen how this uh, inequality has uh, deepened in different uh, Western European countries as well, but also between countries. If we do a comparison uh, of, on the relationship between richer and poorer countries, women and girls in all of this situation, as has happened in several conflicts, are usually caught in the middle and they have been particularly affected. So we see also how then this poverty and inequality experienced by women and girls is the result or are the result of uh, not only choices of these last years, but also historical choices that are set in a broader range of um, social relations that are usually patriarchal and that reflect also different historical happenings such as colonialism, such as the experience of racism and also classism or the discrimination on the basis of socioeconomic condition. So against that broader background, we see how the situation of the last three years has especially affected uh, women and girls. And we see how economic systems, and there are several uh, academic studies on this, uh, economic systems are, have been built on the basis of these underlying and structural forms of uh, discrimination and forms of seeing and of understanding the world in which male power usually and corporate power as well has been privileged. So what we are saying uh, here is that not only uh, are the measures taken by global economic and financial institutions gender blind, meaning that they do not adequately study, look at, consider the experiences of women and girls, but uh, that they are actually gender biased, meaning that they are tilting or balanced, unbalanced actually, in favor of male and corporate forms of power. And as I say, there are several academic studies in this, and I would be glad to provide sources in this uh, respect. So what we see from these studies, as well as from uh, the documentation and data provided by international uh, economic institutions and international human rights institutions as well, we see how these are structural phenomena and that they are actually affecting, again, as climate uh, justice activists have uh, emphasized, the development of uh, ordinary people, one could say, people that do not hold those forms of very um, strong male or corporate power, uh, and that they are actually uh, making countries' responses to these crises very difficult or at some points impossible, and that this is also connected to the ecological collapse and to the effect that this will have on uh, future generations. So this is the, the, the global phenomena. What can we assess from the lens of international human rights law? When we look at these, uh, let's say macro uh, data, when we look at these uh, situations of crisis, but at the same time of resilience, it's not only crisis, it's also a very uh, strong resilience and a civil society organization. Uh, especially is strong in some parts of the world to try to answer to this. How can this be viewed from the perspective of international human rights law? So we know from the UN Charter that uh, international corporations and socioeconomic issues has been conceived since the beginning of the current legal system in Article 1.3 uh, of the UN Charter, in Article 51, 55 uh, of the UN Charter, and in Article 62, we see how there are specific obligations of UN member states 
has to protect human rights and fundamental freedoms and to actively trigger mechanisms for their uh, protection, fulfillment, and guarantee. And we see how, as you may see on the screen, these uh, human rights and fundamental freedoms are also to be pursued and constructed through the Economic and Social Council that uh, reviews the reports presented by international economic and financial institutions, such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. So this is to say that what these institutions do is not isolated and detached from human rights obligations. These institutions and the recommendations they give, for example, in terms of austerity measures or the economic measures that are to be take, taken in the face of inflation, uh, monetary uh, recommended policies. These uh, recommendations and policies are within the UN system because they are dictated by bodies within the system itself. And therefore, they should be based on the UN Charter in terms of these legal obligations. We see also how international human rights law has really shifted the focus from the traditional subject of international law being the state, who is actually the primary actor uh, uh, in charge of these obligations that we are seeing in terms of Article 1, 55, and 62 of the Charter. This is still the case. But at the same time, human rights law has moved the focus to address individual human beings and their possibility to reclaim and to activate states' human rights obligations in this respect. So while the traditional duty bearer is still the state, we have as rights holders, human beings through the different human rights instruments and mechanisms that have been created. So for those of you who may not be so familiar with this, in order to address uh, the second question as to how human rights law could better address uh, this global context of women's poverty and inequality, let us look at the main mechanisms that have been created through the uh, Commission on Human Rights created in 1946 and that since 2006 is now has now been substituted by the Human Rights Council, which is a body dependent on the UN General Assembly, that is the most democratic uh, state, uh, the most democratic sorry, body within the UN system in which the 193 states are represented, plus uh, Palestine and uh, the Holy See as observers. And so within that uh, broad, uh, widespread democratic body of the General Assembly, the Human Rights Council reports to the uh, Assembly and creates a series of human rights mechanisms to try to really ensure in practice the human rights that have been developed on the basis of the UN Charter and through specific international human rights treaties. We see the Universal Declaration of Human Rights adopted in 1948 and which is now customary international law as the main instrument that sets out a list of specific human rights that are protected on the basis of Articles 1 and 55. And we see how those rights are protected through different sources or branches of international law, not only international human rights law, but also uh, international refugee law, international humanitarian law, the regime applicable uh, in armed conflict, and international criminal law. We will look at these questions today mainly on the basis of international human rights law, which, uh, based on the Universal Declaration, refers to all human rights equally, civil and political, and economic, social, and cultural. And I mention this because we know how historically economic, social, and cultural rights have been, in a way, uh, a bit sidelined or minimized, in, including in the international legal framework. Uh, because after the Cold War, there was no clear uh, prioritization to, to place all of these human rights at a level of equal hierarchy. And so the Salomonic decision was taken in the context of the Cold War to adopt, instead of one, global human rights treaty, which would have been the logical consequence after the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948. Since this was not possible because of this Cold War political context to 
international treaties were adopted, as we know, one on civil and political rights and one on economic, social and cultural rights adopted in 1966, entered into force in 1976. Um, however, in a post Cold War context, after this extreme polarization was surpassed, and some say that we are now uh, with the situation of, of uh, Russia, Ukraine and uh, the fight for uh, let's say a he hegemonic control between uh, the US and China. We are living, living uh, to a certain extent in a Cold War revisited or a new type of um, geopolitical accommodation. Still, uh, the 1993 Vienna Declaration and Program of Action is valid today and applicable today if we think of the effects of COVID-19 especially, where we see that it is extremely crucial to reaffirm the interdependence between all human rights, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural, because as the Vienna Declaration affirmed, all are universal, indivisible, and interdependent. The Universal Declaration, together with these two covenants, as we know, is what is uh, usually termed uh, or known as the International Bill of Human Rights, and it entails legally binding obligations for states, including all of the bodies within the state, as well as for other actors to be supervised by the state, including in the points of combating poverty and inequality. The COVID-19, as I was saying, it really makes visible the interconnectedness between rights. If one thinks of the measures taken in uh, during confinement, the uh, obligation for people to stay at home and to wash their hands constantly. How does that reflect and how does that impact people who do not have a home or who do not have running water? So we see obviously how rights such as freedom of movement are connected to right to housing, are connected to right to water, uh, are connected to the right of an adequate standard of living and to a dignified life with the minimum socioeconomic conditions, not only for a physical subsistence, but as the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has recently said, not only the right to life, but the right to li a life with dignity. And this is what human rights law can provide as a first understanding, the right to a life with dignity. Now, we know that there are two main mechanisms of protection of these human rights of the International Bill of Rights, mainly through the treaty-based bodies and the charter-based bodies that derive their legitimacy and their um, competences from the charter directly. And in this sense, if we look at the first of those two mechanisms, the treaties and the supervisory and interpretative bodies of the treaties provide us with several elements to understand how we can better spell out obligations of states and other actors to combat women's and girls' poverty and inequality, and really poverty and inequality more generally. You have on the screen the main, the nine core human rights treaties with each of their supervising and interpretative bodies. And each of these uh, bodies has referred to different aspects that are important for uh, women's human rights and poverty and inequality. I will focus particularly on the uh, interpretations by uh, the second body that you see on the screen, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, supervising the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights that, as I mentioned, has usually uh, or has historically been minimized, but that today, at this point, 2023, is at an equal status with civil and political rights, not only because of the Vienna Declaration, but also because in 2008, an optional protocol to this covenant was adopted. And in this optional protocol, a mechanism to claim the violation of human rights protected in the covenant has been activated. So the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights since 2015, in uh, the year in which it, resol it resolved its first case actually against Spain, has really looked more closely at the specific scope of obligations in terms of the right to housing, the right to water, the right to education, the right to work, the right to health, if we think of COVID. So 
what do these rights really mean in practical terms for states and other actors such as business corporations and also macroeconomic actors such as the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Apart from this second body, I would also like to concentrate on uh, number four, the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, the CEDAW Committee, which supervises uh, the convention with the same name. Still, it's important to keep in mind that all of these bodies and all of these covenants include specific rights and obligations that are pertinent to uh, combating poverty and inequality of women and girls. If we look at the second branch of mechanisms, those based directly on the, on the UN Charter, also known usually as uh, UN Human Rights Special Procedures, these charter-based bodies or special procedures derive their competences from their appointment by the Human Rights Council. And you see there the line going down from General Assembly, Human Rights Council, special procedures, and how the special procedures create and appoint uh, working groups, collective bodies, or special rapporteurs, but their legal nature is the same, and they both perform uh, very similar uh, functions, namely country visits, communications to state parties, and um, annual thematic reports. Uh, in the working groups, you see the example of the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls, uh, of which I have the honor of forming part, and we have actually focused on this issue of women's poverty and inequality. And in those uh, analysis, we have highlighted both the negative obligations of states in the sense of abstaining from uh, violating human rights, in this case for creating conditions that can facilitate poverty or inequality, for instance, prohibiting girls uh, uh, from going to school or prohibiting women to work, as is happening now in Afghanistan with the Taliban de facto authorities. Um, positive obligations as well in terms of actively creating normative frameworks, public policies, practices, programs that uh, are conducive to the fulfillment of human rights, particularly economic, social, and cultural rights, and the right of access to justice, the rights of claiming, of having mechanisms to claim violations of those uh, rights. And uh, through these negative and positive obligations, we have the traditional three uh, state duties of respecting, protecting, and fulfilling human rights. And this means that uh, states have concrete obligations to look at these disproportionate impacts of poverty and inequality and to uh, actively seek to regulate, uh, to better regulate, for example, corporations, uh, for example, the uh, increase in domestic violence that was created through the, the confinement or that was facilitated rather through the confinement to look at what non-state actors are doing as well, not only public institutions, but what is happening in homes, what is happening in corporations and how this is affecting women and girls. Um, and I'll give some examples or, of what those disproportionate impacts are. Um, so special procedures through the affirmation of these uh, duties to uh, protect, fulfill and guarantee uh, can carry out, as I mentioned, country visits, can issue urgent appeals, uh, and can also uh, look at, uh, for example, amicus curiae uh, and prepare those amicus curiae instruments that, or documents rather, that support uh, strategic litigation to claim, for instance, the right to housing uh, of women. We know that in many countries today, women don't have access to property individual access to property and that this has to be facilitated by a male relative. And this was, uh, uh, they, we have similar restrictions in the case of Spain, still in the 1970s. Uh, we know how women's right to inherit property or for instance, in some uh, countries uh, that follow Sharia law up to date, the prohibition of women to transfer their nationality to their children. So obviously these restrictions on property, inheritance, access to nationality, therefore access to justice, impact women and girls in uh, different ways or in more serious ways than what the general phenomena of poverty and inequality would affect uh, men and boys. So we have these comparative and more restrictive norms uh, and policies, but we also have um, 
different forms of practices that affect women and girls particularly. Let's think of those that have been traditionally highlighted by authors, such as uh, the unequal distribution of care work, the unequal distribution of domestic work. It is calculated that uh, women carry out, depending on the country, between two and sometimes 10 times more domestic work than their male uh, partners or than the male uh, persons living in that household. We know how, apart from the unequal distribution of care work, caring for children, caring for older persons, caring for persons with disabilities, usually this work is unpaid. So we know also that this has an economic impact on women uh, more specifically. And we have seen how because of the pandemic and the confinement, many girls stopped going to school. And because of the economic uh, crisis, they also are carrying on their shoulders the load, a, a higher load or a stronger load of domestic work and care work. And this means for many girls, according to UNICEF, uh, 11 million girls that did not return to school after the confinement. So we see this, these disparate, disproportionate impacts. And we also know, as you can see, on the screen, and this has been highlighted by human rights special procedures, precisely this second branch of the charter based bodies have really highlighted how extreme poverty is not only living on less than $290 a day, if we use some of the most conservative uh, indicators uh, by the World Bank, but it also includes uh, a lack of income, but a lack of access to basic services as well, for instance, public health for instance, housing loans to be able to access uh, housing and social services, transportation. It also means social exclusion. And it is not then a coincidence that we see how sustainable development goal number one is not only to reduce poverty, but actually to eliminate poverty. We know that we are far from that goal. We also know that before the pandemic, uh, in the uh, 20 years between the year 2000 and 2020, there had been a decrease in global poverty, but from 2020, the pandemic to now, there has been an inc increase. Some say that we have moved back 25 years. This is according to World Bank and other uh, figures. So we think that now, uh, or I think that now, I propose to you that now we should concentrate not only on uh, sustainable development goal one, but also, uh, and obviously to the 17 sustainable goals, but looking at this topic, we should emphasize sustainable development goal five on gender equality and sustainable development goal 10 on reducing inequality. It's not only an issue of combating poverty and making those that are at the lower scale of the system be a bit better off. It's also about reducing the inequalities between those at the top and those at the bottom. Human rights law has sometimes been uh, criticized by looking too much at the floor and not so much at the ceiling. And this is a criticism that I believe scholars and activists of human rights have to take seriously. I also believe that there are many civil society organizations and there is evidence of this have actually used the human rights norms and architecture of the treaties that I mentioned and the special procedures interpretations to fight for further equality and socioeconomic justice, but we still have to do, uh, I think, a better job in, in that sense. And part of the efforts that that uh, I have worked on uh, look at these uh, avenues. How can we use human rights law and tools to try to further uh, the, the shortening or the, the, the closing of these gaps between the rich and the poor? And this includes several measures that can be taken from a feminist and a human rights based perspective. What is uh, a feminist uh, approach to these issues? Uh, this means that we reaffirm substantive uh, equality for women in the legal, social, economic, cultural, political, environmental arenas uh, of life. And while gender equality, according to Article 2 of the CETA Convention and, and several human rights instruments, is a right in itself, and feminism in this sense is connected to a human rights-based approach, but the feminist approach, apart from the general human rights-based approach, adds the critical analysis 
of uh, looking at patriarchal institutions and the way that systems are constructed and those underlying forms of discrimination that sometimes are not so visible at first hand um, and that contribute to maintaining discrimination against women and girls. So the human rights based approach would push us to emphasize the respect by states and other actors to principles uh, that are general in human rights law, such as participation, accountability, non-discrimination and equality, empowerment, um, and equitable normative uh, frameworks. So these are general principles, I know, but that when we uh, materialize them in concrete situations can offer a practical guide to how to build, for instance, the, the bodies, the executive bodies and the governing bodies of corporations under a view of equality and non-discrimination, one would uh, recommend gender parity and gender parity in all institutions from government institutions, from university institutions to economic actors as well. Once you have women on an equal basis sitting at the table, the dynamics change. And this is not only uh, positive and more efficient uh, for all of these institutions and for society generally, it is also a matter of human rights law. It is also a matter of equality and non-discrimination. Um, and we know that the standardized measures of poverty and inequality usually overlook, as I said at the beginning, the experiences of women and girls. I'll give a very concrete, concrete example of that. The measurements we see of poverty usually are based on household income. So the, the different uh, studies will analyze the income in a specific household. This does not analyze intra-family dynamics, who is holding power within the household, and then how that income, if it's whatever it is, a uh, thousand euros a month, how is that distributed to the inside of the family and the men and boys, women and girls within that family? So, so this is just one example of how standardized measurements of poverty will not take into account these gendered aspects and issues of equality and non-discrimination that human rights law can help to, to promote. Um, and they also don't uh, capture these um, inequalities in the generation, distribution, and consumption of resources. So one, one example that feminist and human rights-based approaches are pushing for in terms of how to use human rights law for further equality is in tax law. Human rights law has usually not uh, addressed tax law that directly. And several organizations and scholars are now saying we should tax or, or governments should tax and international institutions should recommend as well, taxing, further taxing of those at the top of the spectrum, of the socioeconomic spectrum. Um, and not only in direct taxes, but direct taxes to wealth. So this is an example that I that I put forward and that can be uh, studied further, but that is now actually being discussed within human rights mechanisms when it usually used to be uh, an issue reserved to very technical economic bodies. This is now an issue that is being viewed under the lens of human rights law. So um, we, I think that these feminist and human rights based approaches have to be the norm when we are considering poverty and inequality generally, because even if we consider poverty and inequality generally, even if we don't mention specifically women and girls, we know that women and girls are half of humanity. So sometimes I'm surprised when people say, uh, I'm, a, I'm a feminist economist, economist, or I'm a feminist political scientist. And people have to make this clarification or this specification, because we know how usually women and girls' rights or needs have been sidelined. But really, you could just be an economist without the previous adjective. You could just be a, a, a political scientist because you would have to look at both halves of humanity. And also here, I'm not specifically considering, but I do consider, or I'm not specifically mentioning, but I do consider included, obviously, people uh, that are gender diverse or that hold a different gender identity that is not uh, within the, the, the norm of, uh, of the dual consideration of men, boys, and women, and girls. But roughly speaking, in numerical terms, anyone studying these issues would have to consider women's and girls' poverty. Still, because this has been made invisible often, it is sometimes necessary to really 
bring it to light and to put it first and foremost in our considerations. So from all the instruments uh, of human rights, particularly those developed by the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that has called for um, specific policies for protecting housing, water, uh, economic and social rights, prioritizing those in the most vulnerable situation and avoiding and specifically combating gender inequality, as well as the CEDA committee and its interpretations that push for gender parity for affirmative action measures as included specifically in the CEDA convention of which Spain and all countries uh, at the level of the European Union and the Council of Europe are a part too. Uh, and also I, I don't even enter into specific uh, treaties on uh, violence against women. Uh, this would push us, these norms would push us to uh, adopt gender uh, sensitive budgeting. So when we construct budgeting and public policies, we have to have a gender analysis. And uh, a first step to that or a parallel step to that is ensuring gender parity in decision making bodies. And I'm just giving some examples as to how we could uh, approach these issues from a gendered perspective. And the ultimate step to, to this would be constructing a feminist human rights based economy. Now, the current uh, UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Volker Turk, um, who uh, has come after Michelle Bachelet, that uh, many of you may, may, may know of her work, um, he is really pushing for a human rights based economy that would privilege those in, in most vulnerable condition, that would actively use the tools given by these norms as standards and interpretations in human rights to construct public policy and normative uh, frameworks. For example, in terms of tax law, trade law, the measures adopted by um, uh, global economic institutions. And uh, I go back in a parenthesis to one of the points I mentioned previously in terms of austerity measures. When uh, uh, the IMF recommends austerity measures, what does that mean in practical terms? That states are gonna cut down on social policy and that they are cut, gonna cut down on public spending in, for example, uh, places for childcare, places for care of the elderly, uh, places for care, public spaces for care of persons with disabilities. And who is that in most societies going to impact on the most? On women and girls who are probably, as we know, going, as we know from, from proven studies and statistics, going to absorb those roles uh, of care with the uh, impossibility that that means in terms of the exercise of their other rights. So all the money that countries also are spending, for instance, on, on uh, complying with public debt and on what the rich countries have lent to the poor countries or international economic institutions have lent, all that uh, economic and financial effort to cover those debts impacts in not having enough liquidity to actually cover social policies. And again, this is something that through a gendered and human rights based lens has also been studied and I can uh, gladly provide some specific authors and uh, further examples for those who are interested. So apart from this push for a human rights based economy that has been um, really actively promoted by the UN High Commissioner, um, what I would propose as well is a feminist human rights based economy with this uh, additional lens of uh, criticism towards patriarchy, colonialism, racism, that this view feminist or, or feminists, if we say it in plural views, uh, provide. Um, and also a propositive angle, a constructive angle as to how could we uh, uh, construct these economies better, not only criticize, but also on the constructive side. We see many movements, uh, as I mentioned before, the climate justice activists, the Green Deal, the social justice movements that are really putting concrete proposals on the table and that with these proposals they are trying to make uh, a reality what was already conceived from the charter and human rights instruments since the beginning a society where societies actually also at the global level where substantive equality solidarity and socio-economic and environmental justice are made uh, possible some of these ways, uh, and I end with these three very specific proposals in this constructive approach, are to for states to comply with the immediate obligations to eliminate discrimination, 
under human rights instruments and to guarantee what is called uh, in human rights law, the minimum core, the, the, the minimum available that even countries in poverty can provide. There are several studies on this of all economic, social and, and cultural rights, as well as their progressive realization in the sense of not going back to standards that we already have. For example, if there was already a certain percentage of public spending dedicated to healthcare, uh, there's a prohibition to turn back on that uh, under human rights law, even in situations of crisis. Or for example, if sexual and reproductive health rights for women and access to contraception services, action to uh, prenatal uh, care, care at birth, postnatal care, access uh, to voluntary interruption of pregnancy as, as provided by, by law in a secure and, uh, and safe manner. If there are setbacks in this, if there are rollbacks that we see that there is a gender backlash in several countries in the world, including as we have seen um, in recent years uh, in, in Western countries, in Poland, in Hungary, in the US, apart from other countries, obviously Afghanistan, Iran, Yemen, we see these examples worldwide and we are not immune to them. So these setbacks are in prohibition of the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. Secondly, uh, there would be a recommendation, a proposal for states to create and promote mechanisms for justiciability, so for access to justice of the rights uh, in the uh, Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Covenant, as well as in CEDO on specific human rights of women by ratifying those instruments and the optional protocols that allow for individual communications to claim those rights. And lastly, to fulfill the obligations of international assistance that is provided for in Article 2 of the Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, international assistance of wealthier states for poor states, that this is not only an issue of development policy, this is actually an issue that has a normative, solid background in human rights law. So these uh, mechanisms together with gender budgeting, gender parity, uh, an explicit consideration of intrafamily dynamics when we are measuring poverty and inequality are mechanisms that can contribute to uh, this substantive equality and socioeconomic and environmental justice that I mentioned. So my proposal is that these human rights-based perspectives can actually help to construct a culture of peace, cooperation, and solidarity uh, to confront the poverty and socioeconomic inequality that is disproportionately impacting women and girls, and by doing so, benefiting the whole of society. Thank you so much, and I look forward to questions or comments that you may have, and I would ask if you could kindly uh, include them uh, in, the, in the chat. Um, and uh, yes, I, I see someone is asking if you can have the presentation. Yes, uh, for sure, at least on my side, I hope that doesn't uh, violate any UNIWELL rules. I, I, I think not, also because the presentation will be made public on YouTube. And uh, as I mentioned, if you would want to share any reflections, comments or questions, I would be really glad if this is also a, a more uh, interactive, exercise and I hand over to Irene whom I thank again very much for being here. Thank you Professor Estrada Tang for your interesting um, brilliant presentation. Um, there are in question still in the chat but I have um, some question. Professor Estrada I can see you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, thank I think you. automatically it goes like that, but yes, and I see one on the chat as well. So thank you. Okay, so much. okay, there is one. So that's but also change. yours, Irene. <laughs> yeah, after. <laughs> okay, uh, does climate change violate the human rights of women and girls? If so, what rights? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Lydia. Um, yes, I would say a broad yes. Then we have to look at a case by case scenario. Uh, we have some cases. Uh, before different courts at the European level and also the district court, I believe it's in New York, in the state of New York, and I can I can forward you that information if you are interested, where this specific question has been addressed. And what the courts have said, and again, looking at 
each specific government and the measures they have taken or not taken, uh, they have concluded that, that uh, when states do not take sufficient uh, measures to combat climate change, for instance, to comply with their obligations under the Paris Agreement, this is for countries who are a party to, to this agreement, which, uh, which sets forth obligations to reduce uh, the emission of uh, uh, carbon dioxide and the gases that produce uh, a warm uh, a greenhouse effect. Um, when states have not done enough, again, if we think of obligations, both of abstention and of action, then states can be considered responsible. So one would have to study the specific treaties to which each state is a party to, uh, to actually define very precisely which um, human rights obligations are, are, are being violated. Um, but as we have seen and, and feminist authors have, have highlighted, uh, climate change has affected women and girls disproportionately. I'll give uh, an example. In many countries of Sub-Saharan Africa, where it is, uh, women, it is women and girls who primarily carry out the, the functions or the, or the tasks of collecting fuel and of collecting water, in, in, in many places where we know that there is no running water, access to electricity or access to sources of fuel. So this is mostly women carrying this out. And with climate change and for example, the rise of uh, sea level and the, the changes in uh, the, the environment, this, this load has become even heavier. This is what we, we have reported from several women and civil society organizations working, as I said, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. So here we see a specific impact on that. We also know how climate change affects women's bodies differently, including in terms of sexual and reproductive health. And there are several studies in this sense. So as I say, we could I could answer broadly that yes, and there we have right to right to health, right to equality and non-discrimination, right to housing. And then even some very, let's say one could consider simple examples, but uh, I, I once heard in consultations from from uh, women organizations in New Guinea who would carry out on the beach, they would carry out training to defend themselves from, from domestic violence or violence in, in the street. Um, and with uh, climate change, those beaches are disappearing. The, the sea level is rising and the, the beach is basically disappearing. So they were reporting and, re and narrating how that 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 very one would consider uh, neutral uh, harm that climate change produces actually has a direct impact on them because they cannot pay, for example, for private gyms or for a place where you would learn boxing or different techniques of defense or survival. They had that public space, which was there open for everyone, but that was actually being used by women and that they see uh, how these daily practices are being modified by by climate change. So again, these are some examples, both macro and more micro examples where we see this harm. And again, we would have to analyze on a case by case uh, basis, the obligations of each of each uh, state. So thank you, Lydia, for your question. We have one more question, Professor um, Estrada um, from Pascual Cantos. Um, in your opinion, um, ask uh, what are the most worrying issues in the topic concerning Spain? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So if we look at the case law that the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has addressed, we see that most of the cases are referred to right to housing. So this probably comes from the, from this is a consequence uh, or a tale of a consequence from the 2008 uh, crisis that came from speculation in the in the housing market and uh, mortgages, uh, and so we see how those effects. And, and I mean, we have seen at national level several platforms and civil society movements in favor of the right to housing. So when the committee, uh, when the committee's competence to address uh, issues under the covenant was activated, actually Spain was the first EU country to ratify the optional protocol to the covenant and economic, social and cultural rights that then opened the door for these individual communications. So if we looked at both happenings, the 2008 economic crisis and how it impacted particularly Spain, 
and then also the ratification by Spain of the optional protocol, then we see how most of the cases that the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights has addressed are against Spain and within those particularly concerning the right to housing. Now other countries have also ratified in, in more recent years, Italy, Luxembourg, there are some cases against Ecuador, who I mean right now is particularly suffering in many uh, respects, but I would say as to Spain, this is this is one of the most worrying topics, at least at the international level, at least as to what issues have reached those international human rights uh, bodies. Thank you again, Professor Estrada. We have an, a new question. At the beginning, you defined poverty as a structural phenomena. Recently, a Spanish politician on elections period denied the existence of social justice, saying that this is a concept of the political left. Wouldn't this be violating the United Nations covenants? Do you think this would be within the framework of those setbacks you talk about? Very interesting question. Thank you, Almudena. I, I think, well, I don't agree with that affirmation. I think social justice is 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 a, a concept that is extremely helpful for, for everyone, whichever side of the political spectrum you are at. And actually, if you look, that that's really actually not very accurate or precise if one looks at the historical happenings that triggered the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These, these points were actually addressed there and precisely the outcome of those discussions was to include all human rights and rights that one could consider are more closely connected to social justice, such as economic, social and cultural rights and access to justice for those rights, all of them included equally with equal hierarchy in the Universal Declaration. So the, the outcome of those of those historical discussions in 1947 and 1948 was actually to consider all of them. And we see how through history this has been with different moments and different ups and downs, this has been, in the end, reaffirmed, especially by the adoption of this recent optional protocol on economic, social, and cultural rights. So if that is an example or an illustration of the setback, I would say probably yes. It's true that we see uh, the gender backlash and the retrocession more clearly exemplified if one thinks of sexual and reproductive health rights, for instance, or also access of women to political participation, and then the, the going back or reaffirmation of women's traditional roles of caretakers, of domestic workers, these sort of conceptions. And again, Afghanistan is probably the most extreme uh, example, but I would say probably also denying uh, the existence and the importance of social justice would probably go against the covenant and really against the spirit and the logic of the whole range of human rights uh, instruments. It also goes against even some of the most basic uh, basic norms, not only of human rights uh, institutions, but also even of the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, or if one thinks of the International, uh, the World Trade Organization or the UN, um, area on trade and development, even those actually have at their core uh, objectives, the combating of poverty and the construction of equality. And if one looks at the sustainable development goals as well, and this is an adoption, uh, the, the 2030 sustainable development agenda by all of the states of the General Assembly. So I think, again, that affirmation, both in historical, normative, and in current terms, I think uh, really denies uh, the reality and, and does not have a, a, a real basis to be uh, sustained. Thank you, Almudena, for your question. Thank you, Professor Estrada, for your answer. Uh, we have maybe one, okay, no, one question more. Okay, I have a question. So I would like to ask you, what is the impact of the reports and other acts of uh, special procedures in practice? Mm -hmm. um yeah at the moment <laughs> thank mm -hmm. you professor thank you so much Irene. and and i'm glad you asked that because that's that's i think probably the next practical question right once we document all this once we propose specific feminist and human rights based approaches for instance in a report then what happens right what what practical impact does that have 
So the reports as such by special procedures are not binding instruments in and of themselves. The report as such is not a sentence. It is not a judicial or a quasi-judicial resolution. But since the report is constructed or should be constructed on the basis of international human rights law and the recommendations that are included in the reports are directed to states on the basis of those obligations, then there's an indirect link. So they are not per se binding, legally binding, but if you go back in that chain of steps, then you see how uh, states in principle and as part of the principle of good faith that we all know and, and, and I mean, especially in, in, in our case or in the environment of public international law, the principle of good faith is one of the principles of public international law. And so when states have uh, ratified or become a party to all of these human rights instruments, they are obliged to do everything that they can do to the best of their abilities to comply with those treaties, including the interpretation of those treaties. So we can, as I say, trace back that indirect link to the treaties themselves and to the principle of good faith, whereby states are obliged to at least try to comply with those recommendations. And, and actually, if you if you look at the, at, the, at the practical examples of this, you see how usually states usually states also want to do this because they actually don't want to only be uh, criticized. They also want to have practical recommendations and advice as to, okay, these things are wrong, but what, how can we do to improve them? So they are thankful for specific recommendations, especially when you are very concrete and precise. And they also want their best practices to be known. So when they are actually doing things correctly in terms of identifying specific aspects of women's poverty, what are the drivers between uh, poverty and inequality? And when you include this in a report, they are thankful uh, as well. So states are also interested in, in doing things better so that in the next report, uh, they will also be exemplified as, as an example of a best practice. So on both sides, uh, those reports uh, can be useful through this indirect source of, of bindingness, but also through their practical uh, applicability. Yes. It, yes, in your experience, do courts take uh, them into account in your uh, into account, or, or do they impact in their other way? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, legislative process, or mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, so I think we find successful examples of this. This is not always the case, but we do find several ones. So I'll give the example uh, because it's it's closest to home of Spain in the sense that uh, through the visit of the Working Group on Discrimination Against Women and Girls, the official visit to Spain carried out in 2014, um, the Working Group recommended for broader paternity leave uh, in the case of birth uh, and to try to adopt more equal normative frameworks for this. Um, and, and so uh, through the years, this has been adopted and actually as part of the legislative process, when you look at the debates, they, they actually quoted the working group's country report on that as one of the sources. Obviously, it's not the only one, but within the national discussion and legislative process, this was actually taken into account. I recently just read of a of a of the Nash of the sorry, the the local framework in Catalonia that is now giving uh, a longer or an equal uh, paternity uh, leave uh, in the case of, of loss of, of pregnancy of the partner. So when the woman loses uh, a child, even under the 180 days of pregnancy, so under month six, um, and when she loses uh, the child, there so far, there was only uh, some days of, of, of not maternity leave. What I mean is leave from work as part of the of the mourning process of the of the process of confronting that that death. And now they have also amplified that to the to the father. Um, so this is also an example of equality where we see how reports or specific recommendations have been taken into account, not only at the national level, but also in legislative processes at the local level. Right. Sometimes, sometimes the the framework at the and the policies at the level of autonomous communities, regions, or states in several countries can, in, in some cases, uh, be 
possibly more 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 progressive. So so this is also an example where you don't have to wait for the country to do things at the central or federal level, but where actually local actors are extremely important in bringing rights closer to, to people in their everyday lives. Thank you, Professor. Uh, I think you're muted, I think. Yes, I said that, um, I don't know if we, we have uh, time for more questions. So, on, on my side, uh, yes? Yes. 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 Okay. Okay. Yes, of so you recommend um, to create the mechanisms. Um, do you think that in practice, um, people, girls and, and women, um, have um, the tools to use this kind of mechanisms? Or if not, what kind of, uh, what can we do? What can, uh, the society, the, the civil society, do for uh, for um, for a rise uh, to this um, for use this uh, kind of uh, international mechanism to protect them. Yes, yes, thank you. No, I think it's probably the the one of the most important questions. Uh, and in that sense, I think uh, civil society organizations, yes, they play uh, a very relevant role. Universities as well in terms of bringing the, 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 the knowledge of these rights and also the discussion of these rights closer to, to, to people and closer to women and girls. Uh, the stronger a civil society is, then the better that the human rights of people will be known and exercised or claimed. So we know that the change in human rights is not only and not even primarily a legal or political change. This is one part, but it's really a cultural change. Uh, insofar as people own their rights, first of all, know their rights, and then they claim ownership of those rights, they will be able to exercise them. And this means a change uh, in mentality, but also not only from the rights holders, but also from the duty bearers, right? I mean, I remember the Chinese uh, uh, saying that if they had uh, taken the lead in the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, they would have made uh, a universal declaration, not of human rights of individual persons, but of duties of the family. No? So obviously we also have to, 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 to look at the duty bearers, who, who has obligations, because the best guarantee of my rights being respected is the awareness and the consciousness of those who hold duties to respect those rights, for them to know which are the red lines that they should not cross. So this is also knowledge, not also of the rights, but of the obligations. Where are those red lines that you should not cross? And what are your obligations as to actively promoting, not only not violating, but actually actively constructing a culture of human rights? And this is a slow change. We know that this is, that this is slow. We know that it may take uh, from one generation to two, but at the same time, we also see extremely uh, hopeful examples. If we look at uh, climate change and how girls, really girls, persons uh, under 18 years of age or young people more generally, and specifically girls are really at the head, at the lead of promoting reflection on climate change. They are setting the points of the agenda. They are pushing for transformative change. And this is done each time more from a younger and younger age. So I think we should have hope. And here I go to Jane Goodall, the famous scientist and uh, analyst of uh, chimpanzee behavior and how then she has uh, transported that to, to human behavior and how she advocates for hope. And I think there are several reasons uh, for hope uh, to construct a human rights culture. This intervention and, uh, and uh, activism of, of young girls and women, which we would also have to then listen to, including in the universities and how to potentialize that and how to include them in decision-making processes. Um, and also more, more connection between all of us. I mean, we are here right now sitting in an online uh, discussion lecture, and this facilitates access to, to the knowledge of rights and of obligations to people 
all around the world. And the third reason I think for hope is that we have many more mechanisms than we had not even 50 years ago, 10 years ago. We didn't have an international mechanism to claim the right to housing or to water or to education. We have these mechanisms now. And going back to one of your previous questions, we see also how even the International Court of Justice has quoted some of the reports of special procedures, for example, in its advisory opinion on the construction of a wall in the occupied Palestinian territory, or in the case of, um, of uh, uh, Germany against uh, Italy and Greece intervening, the case of jurisdictional immunities of the state. So we see even how those, one could say, more traditional bodies or bodies that are not specifically dedicated to human rights are taking into account those norms and interpretations. And we have those mechanisms. So it's a matter now of activating, as you said, civil society, and again, no movements and, and, and people connecting to other people, even in very far away parts of the world, to claim those rights through the mechanisms that we have now, and at the same time, to comply with our obligations towards others, right? It's the double process. We have to claim our rights, but we also have to construct more just societies. And here again, we go to the situation of inequality. Probably all of us sitting here are probably not living in extreme poverty or in poverty. So we also have the possibility and the duty to construct more just societies to benefit not only those who are living in, in the most vulnerable conditions, but all of us as a society, because more, more equal societies uh, are beneficial for, for, for all of us. And this is also part uh, of the human rights culture. Thank you. So we hope to speak about the reducing uh, poverty or inequality in the next year. So it would be a, a great uh, a new. Um, if there are no more questions, I think we can uh, end the session. So I would like to thank you again, Professor Estralata, for your brilliant and interesting presentation. It would be a pleasure to uh, hear from you. So thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, Irene and Edu and Pascual and all of you for uh, attending. Thank you really so much for this opportunity. And I hope to see you soon or that we can all connect again in a UniWell open lecture series. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.